So you have this ghost of the carvers using these sort of tools uh, quite present on my bench as, as, as I'm carving, and I think that's really fascinating. While the green man was generally seen as being passive and benign, he did have a more violent brother, the wild man of the wood. This intimidating figure was originally a bracket or support on a medieval house, a warning to keep your distance. The bracket depicts uh, a wild man standing with his club. He's standing on top of a, of a grotesque, dog-like mask. He's literally under his heel. And the wild man is a fascinating character in medieval culture. He's known from at least the 12th century and probably long before. And he is a symbol of strength, of virility. That's very clearly emphasized by this enormous phallic club that he's holding. He's a symbol of uh, unreasonable urges. He symbolizes, too, the natural life force that is, is running through trees. And it's, it's particularly fascinating to remember that a bracket like this would have been carved from green or unseasoned timber. So, as it were, the life force in the timber has been converted into this wonderful figure. Wood was crucial to the Christian faith, and because it was so important to people in the Middle Ages, wood was the perfect medium to teach the stories of the Bible to even the most uneducated churchgoer. One of the most important biblical figures for medieval worshippers was the Old Testament figure of Jesse, who was always depicted at the base of a tree. He was seen as the root of Christianity, the start of a royal line that would eventually lead to the birth of Jesus Christ. In medieval society, your bloodline was all important, and Jesse was proof that Jesus came from noble stock. And on the English-Welsh border, Jesse was to take on a truly remarkable form. This solitary figure is just a small piece of what the carvers intended. It was originally the base of a huge array of statues. Attacked during the Reformation, it's still a monumental work of art that seems to carry otherworldly, pagan resonances. It's the recumbent figure of Jesse, who was the father of David. It's the visual aid for Christianity, because that piece going up there actually continued with figures on either side to represent all of the forebears of Joseph, who was the father of, putative father anyway, of, of, of uh, Jesus. And it showed all of this lineage and it was to fulfill the prophecy in the book of the prophet Isaiah that when the Messiah comes, he will be of the house of David, the stem of Jesse. So for an illiterate population, this was him telling them what it was all about. And you will see this sort of indent here where there would have been a jewel. So painted all over, one piece, astonishing piece, and this stem that would have gone right up there is a branch of the oak. So that it must have been very difficult to get the right piece of oak by the craftsman and then worked on, um, presumably just this one piece, brought in here. And it must have taken them ages to do it because it is, it is extraordinary the way that they've managed to capture the flow of the garments. Just look at that lovely flow there and the fall, the way the cloth then falls over his knee. You, you can see the belt, look at it here. 
there's the, the cross piece just falling away and the buckle. It's, it's natural and I think that's, that's what is so very, very clever about it. And we think, of course, that um, they were primitive and crude. There's that general feeling of people that they weren't great artists. We've not changed greatly. Their skills were enormous. As the church grew in power and wealth, it embarked on a great construction project. This building boom was to see places of worship in every town and village across the land. And the demand for carpentry only increased as wood carving became a trade. As early as the 13th century, a carpenter's guild was set up to ensure the quality of their work. There was a strict hierarchy in place, with labourers at the bottom doing all the wood preparation, apprentices and journeyman carvers in the middle creating more detailed work. But at the top was the great figure of the master carpenter. Master carpenters were gentry. They were highly respected men who travelled widely from commission to commission. I think these craftsmen were highly respected artisans, well paid comparatively, but unlike our image of 20th century artists, the work they were doing was not self-expression, to put it like that. They were providing a product. And there's one place these craftsmen wanted to work. East Anglia was one of the richest areas of medieval England because of its thriving wool trade. The most prosperous people in the region spent their money on creating and furnishing magnificent churches that both honoured God and their generous donors. Woodcarvers were commissioned to transform churches into places of wonder and awe. And the grandest, most theatrical of all this decoration was the rood screen. Rood screens separated off the main body of the church where the congregation was from the place where the action was, uh, from the priests who were performing the mass. And what you would have had was this boxed off area where the sound of the chanting and the singing would have floated out uh, into the congregation. Incense might have floated out into the congregation, but it was not participative, people weren't taking part in the service, it was all going on inside this, this perfume box. This screen is one of the largest in the country, over 50 feet long and 20 feet high. And it was carved in the style of the Middle Ages, the Gothic. The Gothic conveyed the glory of God through light, intricate decoration that reached up to heaven itself. Timber, because it is light, easy to work and very strong, it can break the sinews of reality in architecture. It can imitate stone forms, but do it in such a way that it's inconceivable that they could be stone. And so the onlooker has this wow factor. He sees something that looks as though it's built of stone, and yet it's far too big. How is that structurally possible? The Gothic aesthetic is very much bound up with creating spaces that people are overawed by. They can't comprehend them. They are structurally impossible. And of course, timber is the perfect way of creating those kinds of spaces. On top of the rood screen would have sat a rood, a cross or crucifix. Roods were systematically taken down and destroyed during the 16th and 17th centuries. Indeed, until the beginning of the 20th century, every single rood was believed to have been lost.
But in 1912, a remarkable discovery was made. These are the remains of the only rood to survive from the Middle Ages. It was discovered in the walls of a church in Gloucestershire. I think it speaks very powerfully about the way that people valued these images and that somehow um, when you're looking at, uh, from a medieval perspective, when you're looking at an image of Christ dead on the cross, all of the kind of religious emotion that that um, stimulates as you gaze upon it, I think we can't really underestimate how deep that went, you know. I mean, it is an extremely beautiful piece, and there is something very particular about the quality of wood that animates these sculptures and makes them lifelike. There's a degree of naturalism in this, I think, particularly in the way that death is rendered, um, that I think probably did create strong connections with the congregation. I do have a very strong response to it, um, not least of all because it is, both fragments are so incredibly fragile. Now, part of their history, of course, is that they were immured in this church wall. They largely rotted as a consequence of that, and they rotted from the inside out. So, in fact, what you're looking at are essentially like two eggshells. There isn't anything in the center of them. But it makes me even reluctant to handle them because there is something so ephemeral about them that you feel that they could just really dissolve and disappear. Lawrence Beckford is working to restore a lost root screen. These 16th century panels were originally from a Devon monastery. They were dismantled and removed during the Reformation. They only survived because they were reincarnated as a chimney piece in a local stately home. Lawrence is one of the few carvers who can bring this sort of medieval woodwork back to life. He's recreating what was lost in fresh oak, which will then be stained to fit in with the rest of the work. And Lawrence has a special affinity for rood screens. When I started my apprenticeship, the company I worked for did a lot of ecclesiastical work so I was sent to the churches, historic buildings, um, and I was faced with, with medieval woodwork, medieval screens, fantastic tracery. Um, and obviously I was in awe. I was a young chap. Um, I saw this wonderful, wonderful carving, full of life, full of vigor, and I thought I'd love to work on screens like that. When you work on a piece of original medieval woodwork, you have to really study the tool marks, the way the lines flow, and you start to learn how free those carvers were. I think many people think you know, they were maybe at a bench and they were being told exactly what to do. And I don't believe that. I think they were very free. They were allowed to express their inner feelings. And that's what I can see in the woodwork now. So as I work on those pieces of carving, I almost get a feel of what they may have felt. And I have to feel that, I think, because I need to put that into my work. Otherwise, you'll see a huge, huge difference. Over the years of carving, it's become part of me. And I don't know what I would do if I didn't carve now. It's really, really in me. Um, and it's taught me, it's taught me a lot about, about life, how if you, how you can achieve something from, from very little, from a, a piece of plain wood uh, with, with the commitment and focus and having ideas in your, in your head, how you can, with, with some tools, how you can produce some lovely works